you too, nearing capacity on our Zoom. We're also uh, streaming this presentation live on Facebook, uh, but we will not be broadcasting the Q&A portion uh, to respect everyone's privacy. Uh, also, we would like to let you know that we're recording this Zoom meeting. Uh, and if you would like to participate in the Q&A, please do stay on this Zoom platform. Uh, the recording of this pre presentation will also be available by request. And uh, so today our agenda is that uh, we'll have our welcome until 610. And from 610 to 615, we will go into the purpose of this session. Then from 615 to 640, we will have uh, uh, Takao Suzuki from Little Tokyo Service Center speak. And then we'll also have Malcolm Young from Chinatown CDC. Uh, and then from six, uh, 705 to 750, we will have 45 met, uh, minutes dedicated to the Q&A. And from 750 to 8 p.m., we will have a conclusion. Uh, so we really wanted to leave a lot of time uh, for a productive discussion during the Q&A session uh, so that we could have as much uh, interaction and questions as possible. My name is Nina Bazan Sakamoto, and I am the project manager for the Japantown Cultural District at the Japantown Task Force. And uh, it's such a pleasure to have you all here today. Uh, so I just wanted to, uh, we also have uh, our executive director, Steve Nakajo, uh, our strategic partnerships coordinator, Susie Kagami, our administrative assistant, Brandon Kwan, uh, and our Japantown Task Force Board President, Sandy Mori, with us today. So uh, the purpose of this Japantown land panel is that uh, we're here because we're in a pivotal moment in our history and a pivotal moment for Japantown. And I think that we're at this, uh, this place right now that we could we are facing a lot of challenges as a community, but these challenges could also be turned into opportunities for regeneration in a thriving future. <laughs> We're here to talk about the topic of community land stewardship uh, because community land stewardship in Japantown is integral for sustaining Japantown's cultural character into the future, as well as meeting community needs such as affordable spaces for our small businesses, spaces for our artists and arts organizations, as well as housing for our community. These are all really essential elements for sustaining Japantown as a cultural heart of our community and also a cultural hub for our Japanese and Japanese American communities into the future. So Japantown has uh, faced many challenges in, to its existence, to its very existence in its 115 year history. And still to now, to this day, we continue to face uh, similar challenges. Uh, our community has been resilient and has uh, survived through forced removal uh, during World War II and incarceration, as well as redevelopment that raised and bulldozed Japantown to the ground. In its heyday, Japantown was 40 blocks, approximately 40 blocks. Uh, and today we continue to face increasing market pressures, gentrification, as well as multiple properties uh, that are currently at risk of being lost. And this is also exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's, uh, but the thing, we're here because we, we would like to, the intention of this space is for our community to collaborate and put our differences aside so that we can create a uh, community determination for our future. And uh, we also have guest speakers with us uh, from, so that we can have insight into uh, how similar ethnic communities have responded to similar challenges uh, to protect the cultural character of their neighborhoods through many models such as community development corporations, community land trusts, community impact funds, and beyond. 
Our hope is that we can spark these important community conversations and eventually move towards developing a consensus-based decision about what models would really serve our Japantown community and what, what kind of models would help us increase our community collective land stewardship towards a more optimistic outcome and growth for a thriving future in Japantown. Today we have special guest speakers, uh, Tak Suzuki, Takao Suzuki, uh, as well as Malcolm. Uh, Takao Suzuki currently serves as the Director of Community Development for the Little Tokyo Service Center. And Takao manages the department that consists of real estate development, asset and property management, and resident services. He began his tenure at LTSC CDC in 2000 as a community organizer through the AmeriCorps program and joined the real estate development department in 2004. He currently serves on the board of the Southern California Association of Nonprofit Housing, Esperanza Community Housing Corporation, Mercado La Paloma Inc., and Little Tokyo Community Impact Fund. He also serves as a district uh, Supervisoral District 1 appointed commissioner of the Los Angeles County Development Authority's Housing Advisory Committee and the member of Federal Home Loan Bank uh, of San Francisco's Affordable Housing Advisory Council and Neighbor Works America's Real Estate Advisory Committee. He holds a BA in social work from California State University of Los Angeles and a master's in urban planning from the University of California in Los Angeles. We also have Malcolm Young, who is the executive director of Chinatown Community Development Corporation. Uh, and he has been there ever since April of 2020. Before this, Malcolm was the deputy director um, of programs and policy manager of Chinatown CDC since 2019, uh, 2009. Malcolm graduated from Duke University uh, and also University of Colorado in Boulder uh, with a master's in history and a degree from Berkeley in law. Um, Malcolm first practiced in venture finance and patent litigations at Perkin Cole and then O'Melveny uh, and Mayor's LLP before joining the Asian Law Caucus in 2003. Uh, so uh, Malcolm was also, he served as the administration of San Francisco's first Asian American mayor uh, to the Honorable Mayor Ed Lee to, for uh, one year to launch the mayor's housing programs. Malcolm likes to tell bad jokes and ride his bike and tortures little children by making them tell uh, him how great of a dad he is. Malcolm is a co-editor of a collection of short historical essays, Chinese American uh, on the American frontier, which, is, which, which can be found on the most exclusive bookstores. So uh, now I will have Steve, uh, our executive director of Japantown Task Force. Thank you, Nina. Welcome everybody. We have over a hundred uh, individuals that are attending tonight's community land panel. And that's uh, very significant. Uh, joining us this evening out of Japantown Task Force, for those of you who don't know, our Japantown Task Force and Japantown Cultural District Board. This evening joining us is uh, Board President Sandy Mori, also from our executive committee, Glennis Nakahara, our vice chair, Ellis Kawahatsu, our secretary, Mark Moraguchi, our treasurer. And in terms of our structure, our transportation land use committee, co-chairs Glennis Nakahara, Kenta, Kenta Takamura. On our cultural heritage sustainability committee, co-chairs Lucy Fisher and David Takashima. Our Peace Plaza committee, our $25 million bond that got passed in November, that this year is our design phase. Next year will be the demolition construction in two years we're gonna be able to utilize that $25 million bond approval to have a Peace Plaza redesign 
out of the energy and the leadership of John and Richard Hashimoto and the Committee of Japan John Task Force. And we also have an ad hoc committee called the Japan Center Mall Technical Committee made up of many, many qualified professionals spearheaded by Lori Yamauchi, Joey Soishi, and Roy Kida. Nina ran down the basics in terms of the purpose and the concepts uh, for us in terms of the Japan Town Task Force Culture District. We, with our formalization of the ad hoc committee has been trying to do our due diligence. Part of that due diligence is trying to educate our committee members, but also our community at large. And we started that process out of a combination of sponsored workshops, outreach to our community. Uh, in terms of uh, March the 8th, our committee had a section that was given by Roy Ikeda, who was a retired attorney, but who also was one of the attorneys that was attached to the covenants writing. It's in terms of when Kintetsu sold their property to 3D. He had a session with us on March the 8th to explain to us the legalese and the concepts behind it in terms of true definitions. On March the 10th, we, Japantown, sponsored a J-Town listening session on housing in collaboration with the planning department in terms of their efforts, in terms of the housing elements. There's a housing plan for the next eight years in San Francisco that's really supposed to be focusing on ethnicity, communities of color. And we followed this in terms of uh, last Monday, April the 12th, where one of our ad hoc committee members, Daryl Higashi, retired from the city and county of San Francisco in the Department of Planning, gave us a session in terms of affordable housing. So for us, it's a due diligence community outreach, which is the product of this workshop this evening with these two great models of community nonprofit corporations and the aspect and the concept of the what ifs as Nihomachi tries to go through this COVID to a point of recovery as we all San Franciscans are trying to do. But the future is something that we all are thinking about and we thought no better model to bring to you than Little Tokyo Services with Tax Suzuki and with Chinatown Neighborhood Development as our neighbor in our community down the block to the left Chinatown. So with that, I'd like to start the session this evening with the introduction of the Development Director of Little Tokyo Services, Tech Suzuki. Tech. Yeah, thank you for that introduction, Steve. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and um, Share my share my screen. Can everybody see? Can everybody see my screen? Mm -hmm. It's a PowerPoint. Just just checking. Yeah. So um, LTSC, so Little Tokyo Service Center. You know, we were established back in 1979 uh, by Bill Watanabe uh, to provide linguistically appropriate and um, you know also culturally sensitive social services for not just Little Tokyo, but also, you know, to the broader Japanese American community uh, here in Los Angeles. Um, you know, our origins, you know, are here in Little Tokyo where, you know, we still, our headquarters are still uh, where we still reside, uh, where we essentially strive for a neighborhood that preserves and celebrates our rich Japanese American heritage. Um, you know, LTSC continue, you know, continually uh, and currently serves as uh, the main Japanese speaking social service provider for those in need of services. And, you know, I think, um, you know, these are some of the, some of the services that we uh, continue to provide. Uh, but, you know, over the years, um, as a way of responding to various changes and challenges facing Little Tokyo and the broader community, um, you know, for the past 40 years, like Little Tokyo Service Center, we've grown pretty significantly in size, uh, scope, and breadth, um, including the establishment of a community development arm, uh, which, you know, oftentimes is referred to as uh, CDCs, Community Development Corporation. And we became a CDC uh, in, uh, back in 1993. Um, and the creation of the CDC uh, came after we completed our first affordable housing project uh, called the San Pedro Firm Building, uh, which, was a which was a preservation project in Little Tokyo 
which was a result of uh, a community organizing effort to save the building from demolition uh, as part of the Civic Center uh, expansion plan. And you know, we've, we've expanded our work um, you know, and mainly over the last, uh, I guess, over the last 30 years or so um, to address the need of um, not just folks in Little Tokyo and not just folks uh, within the Japanese American community, but uh, also to address the needs of the disadvantaged groups of all ethnicities and backgrounds. And we've mainly done this uh, by collaborations and uh, partnering up with community-based organizations uh, that are addressing needs in their um, you know, ethnic in their respective uh, ethnic neighborhoods and low-income communities. And, you know, currently, you know, LTSC now provides services to the greater Los Angeles community, um, you know, including, um, you know, counseling uh, services for homebound monolingual seniors, uh, case management, uh, caregiver support services, um, you know, as mentioned, you know, we do affordable housing development. Um, community organizing, small business tech, you know, assistance, childcare, uh, and so on and so forth. So in terms of our real estate development work, um, you know, we, it was established essentially as an outgrowth of the services we provide. And, you know, since 1993, um, you know, as a leader in community development within the Asian and Pacific Islander community here in Los Angeles, we've developed, uh, uh, a thousand units of affordable housing uh, across uh, 180,000 square feet of community uh, commercial space. And, you know, this amounts to about um, over a quarter billion dollars of investment, uh, not just into Little Tokyo, but other ethnic enclaves in LA, such as historic Filipino town, uh, Thai town, Chinatown, Koreatown, uh, and other neighborhoods. And, um, you know, our, so, you know, our projects generally, um, you know, in some of these ethnic neighborhoods that I've talked about, uh, and in including Little Tokyo, are, you know, located in low income ethnic enclaves that's, you know, historically served as entry points, um, uh, providing jobs, business opportunities, and housing to new immigrants and low income households. And, you know, at the same time, um, you know, displacement, as you guys know, in San Francisco has been a big part of uh, Little Tokyo's history. Uh, you know, first with the internment of our community, then um, the civic redevelopment starting in the, in the 50s, and now with the accelerated gentrification of the neighborhood. Uh, thus, you know, like I think our approach to uh, community development is pretty multifaceted. Um, and, and it's essentially to bring social stability uh, you know, to Little Tokyo. So, you know, a, a major, you know, one of our major long-term visions uh, for LTSC is to preserve Little Tokyo and its uh, unique historical and cultural legacy. And, you know, as a home for low-income individuals, uh, as well as legacy small businesses. And, you know, as part of this vision, we believe affordable housing is a, you know, is a resource and a community asset that really brings stability to you know, families and folks living in, in Little Tokyo. Uh, but, you know, LTSC also believes that um, community benefits could essentially be um, um, expanded uh, when housing units are built as part of our, and, and, and because of that, we use that as part of our uh, overall strategy of community development, which is essentially driven by our goals of, you know, number one, community control, and two, self-determination. So I just want to kind of like run through a couple of um, slides of some of our projects that we've done in Little Tokyo. Um, here is Casa Hewa. Uh, it's a hundred unit multi-family building uh, that we built uh, back in uh, uh, 1996. Um, Here's Far East building. It's 16 units of housing on the historic, on the federally federally designated historic block of Little Tokyo. On the ground floor is uh, the Far Bar, uh, and we also have Far East Lounge, which which is a drop-in center for uh, 
you know, for us uh, and where we provide senior services um, to not just folks uh, in, the, in, in Little Tokyo, but, you know, for the broader community. Here's uh, Union Center for the Arts, um, where it houses three uh, Asian American arts nonprofit organizations. Um, you know, East West Players, you guys must, you, you folks might be familiar with East West Players, Visual Communication, uh, and Art Core, LA Art Core. Uh, but, you know, this is a project that, uh, where we rehabbed a uh, old church uh, after um, uh, the North earthquake in the mid 1990s. And, um, you know, it's become a, a space, a community space where people, um, you know, not just come through and gather, but a um, really a, a space where people could, um, you know, uh, perform arts, um, you know, uh, a gathering space for, um, you know, having meetings and, and whatnot. So our most recent um, completed project uh, is called the Terasaki Budokan. Um, and this is a, a new 51,000 square foot multi-purpose sports and activity center uh, in Little Tokyo. And, um, you know, this includes a gymnasium with basketball courts, uh, an outdoor park, green space. Um, it has an outdoor performance space and, and a terrace that features a community garden and children's playground, um, community room and, and parking. And essentially this is a culmination of uh, of a project that we've been working on for decades. Uh, it really did take us uh, as an organization um, over 25 years to complete, um, you know, and, you know, with the support of, of various public funds, we we're able to access as well as a capital campaign. Um, you know, we were able to complete this project last year. Unfortunately, this, you know, we completed this under the pandemic and um, it hasn't served as, um, we haven't been able to fully open, but we've been able to provide uh, pandemic related services such as providing um, uh, vaccines and, and whatnot. Oops. Just a couple more slides of the Budokan. Um, we're looking to have a grand opening this year. Uh, so if you are in town, um, you know, when we don't have a date yet, but like, please come through. <laughs> Um, I will give you, I'll give anybody a personal tour of the space. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of jump into uh, a few projects and initiatives that we're currently working on. Um, you know, first starting with the project called Go For Broke Apartments. And this is a 228 unit affordable housing uh, project, uh, a community control project of reclaiming a large city owned parcel uh, which was taken away from Little Tokyo back in the 1950s through eminent domain. And, you know, this block, um, you know, historically, you know, housed um, hundreds, um, if not thousands of uh, Little Tokyo residents, uh, you know, back in the you know, 30s, pre-war, back in the 30s, um, 20s, and even uh, after uh, folks came, came back from the internment, um, you know, when they resettled. And when we lost this property, it was a huge, huge loss to the community. And, um, you know, literally over the last couple of weeks, we've been able to expand the footprint of this project uh, from a 77 unit project to, to now a 228 unit project, which will, um, um, you know, which will house not just, not just affordable housing, but uh, we'll be creating open and green space. We'll be activating the commercial ground floor with community serving retail, uh, including, um, uh, the opportunity to house uh, legacy small businesses. Um, so, you know, for us, this is pretty exciting given that, you know, we've been working on this project uh, similar to the Budokan for a number of years. So kind of moving on, uh, another initiative, or I guess another project that we're working on is uh, we're working on a community land trust. And, you know, over the last several months, um, LTSC along with other CDCs. So along with, uh, you know, other community development organizations, uh, we've been engaged in an initiative called um, uh, Community Land Trust or CLT um, to develop a community, a, a countywide uh, com a community land trust pilot program as a strategy to advance community control 
and to address the, you know, the need for affordable housing here in LA. And in short, you know, CLTs are nonprofit organizations. Uh, they're governed by a board of uh, CLT residents and uh, of, of public rep representatives. And essentially, it, the purpose of, of creating these CLTs is to provide lasting uh, community assets and shared equity home ownership opportunities for uh, families and communities. And, you know, for us, um, you know, you know, Little Tokyo is relatively built up um, and there aren't that many opportunities for us to do this in Little Tokyo, but, you know, we were excited to be part of this new pilot project, uh, which I think, um, you know, we're hoping down the line, uh, you know, we could, you know, expand up, uh, expand upon in other, other neighborhoods and, uh, you know, not just in, in, you know, not just in LA, but, you know, throughout Southern California. And, um, you know, as part of this initiative, we were able to push the LA County, um, LA County to pass a motion last month to dedicate $14 million towards this pilot program. And, you know, so I think you'll be hearing a lot more uh, about this project. Uh, we're still in escrow and we're, we will, Little Tokyo Service Center will be closing on um, uh, the acquisition of this in a few weeks. And, you know, at the end of the day, in five years, uh, the plan is for LTSC to turn it, turn over the, this property, this 11 unit property over to this community land trust. And, you know, we were able to, uh, we're, you know, we're able to do this because, um, you know, because of our experience and our background. And, um, you know, ultimately this will go back to the community. So, you know, separate from LTSC, you know, um, you know, me personally, and, and, I, and, you know, Bill Watanabe, who I think is actually uh, a attendee here today, um, you know, a new Little Tokyo initiative that, um, you know, I'm part of and Little Tokyo Service Center is part of, uh, is called the Little Tokyo Community Impact Fund. And, you know, several years ago, you know, our retired uh, founding executive director, Bill Watanabe, brought together, um, you know, a group of folks, a group of community members for a house meeting. Um, you know, to talk about what, what, what we could be doing in terms of preserving, um, you know, the loss of dozens and dozens of small businesses that were closing, you know, mainly due to rent increases, um, you know, heightened, heightened um, real estate speculation due to the, um, the regional subway coming into Little Tokyo. So, you know, Bill essentially, you know, got us together and got us talking. Um, and, you know, after many many meetings and uh, consulting with uh, attorneys, you know, researching best practices from across the country. Um, you know, it was decided that we should create a social purpose corporation uh, to purchase and manage commercial real estate in Little Tokyo as a way to preserve, uh, you know, the legacy of Japanese and Japanese American and other culturally aligned uh, businesses in Little Tokyo. So our approach was essentially to create, um, you know, a social impact fund to ensure that future generations of our community could continue to enjoy our, um, you know, our historic um, uh, small businesses, restaurants, as well as uh, cultural institutions. And, you know, currently um, our investment goal is um, uh, 2.5 million. And, you know, even though the pandemic actually slowed our momentum, momentum a bit, you know, recently, and even though we haven't hit the goal of, two, of raising uh, or, you know, getting investors to hit the mark of 2.5 million, uh, we recently submitted a purchase offer, um, you know, uh, last, I guess last month, which unfortunately did not go through because the seller ended up uh, pulling the property off the market. Uh, but, you know, I think, um, you know, moving forward uh, right now, what we're engaged in is, you know, we're doing a, um, we're reinitiating a, a, a full property assessment of uh, potential uh, available uh, commercial properties in Little Tokyo. So, you know, that's, that's, you know, one of the, one of the things that we're working on, um, you know, through this community impact fund, along with, you know, really, you know, finding more investors and marketing this, uh, this initiative. So, um, you know, for the purposes of this presentation, um, I'm gonna re I'm gonna refrain from uh, from from uh, getting too deep into the weeds, but 
Um, you know, the LTCIF, the Community Impact Fund is governed by a board uh, made up of community members, um, including, you know, including myself, including Bill uh, and others. Um, you know, there are essentially two classes of investment uh, shown here, um, you know, one at a $1,000 level and another at um, a $10,000 level. And it's determined, the eligibility is determined by certain financial requirements, um, which is, um, you know, it's, it's essentially a self-declaration of the person or institution that wants to make that investment. Um, so, you know, you know, in short, you know, this is a relatively new project, but, you know, this is something, um, um, you know, it, it is a, it, it, it's a private entity that, uh, you know, we were able to create and thus, um, you know, we felt that it was a needed kind of effort uh, just because we're just losing so many, you know, we're getting a lot of businesses were getting displaced. And at the end of the day, you know, if it, in, because it's a private effort, there are, uh, you know, much less um, restrictions that, um, that we need to adhere to uh, compared to like, you know, some of our little Tokyo service center projects where, you know, we had to adhere to uh, various government restrictions um, you know, associated with not just funding, but um, um, how we build the building or how we do development, uh, how we, you know, some of the, you know, restrictions associated with use and programming. So, you know, you know, I'm, I'm personally really excited about this project, uh, but in any case, you know, um, you know, I just wanted to, you know, to highlight, uh, highlight this. And this is something that I could definitely share and circulate afterwards. Uh, to anybody involved uh, who, who wants to get involved or people who are interested in, you know, creating a fund up in um, San Francisco, JTOM. Um, but, you know, with that said, you know, I think I'll, I'll stop talking here and kind of hand it back over to, um, to Steve. Thank you very much, Tech. Um, it goes without saying, one of our intentions was to bring this information and to share it with our community, as well as uh, the relationship of us, Yohomachi, San Francisco, Japantown, and Little Tokyo, and Little Tokyo Services, in the interpretation of what we used to describe, and many of the attendees are veterans of the Sansei activism that occurred during that whole decade and this is really, really inspiring as well. Thank you very much. Um, I'm glad that you talked about all of the entities, Community Development Corporation, Community Impact Fund, Community Land Trust, Housing. Thank you very much. I think the continuance of that is our great pride to have Chinatown, San Francisco involved with this workshop and panel. And indeed, in terms of our relationship with Little Tokyo Services, our relationship with Chinatown, Chinatown Community Development Corporations, their former ED, Reverend Norman Fong and Gordon Chin with Malcolm, it is truly an inspiration, but also we thought that they could share their information because they're citywide beyond the community. Uh, at this point, I'd like to introduce um, Malcolm. And so thank you very much for joining us tonight, Malcolm. Take it away. Um, thanks, Steve. Uh, first of all, let me just um, start by saying, and, and Talk uh, knows this, um, uh, we, we like to basically copy every good idea that LTSC comes up with. So we're going to now be launching a Chinatown Community Impact Fund. So thanks for sharing that, Talk. Glad you're not uh, uh, licensing that. Uh, but man, that's really cool. So I, I, I never thought of it that way. And um, uh, love it whenever you know we we can we can follow in your footsteps. Um, on a personal level, I just want to quickly kind of introduce myself a little bit. Um, I know some of the folks uh, in the participant, um, um, you know, that are participating. Some of you are, are new to me. Um, you know, I have been uh, uh, kind of in and around San Francisco um, activism for about twenty years now. Um, and I actually um, uh, specifically just want to call this out. I mean, you know, for me, I, I actually have a lot to be thankful to uh, the San Francisco Japanese American community for because, um, you know, to me, uh, the J community in San Francisco was was my introduction into activism, uh, into community, into sort of a different career path. Um, 
uh, back uh, in the 90s when I was going to law school uh, in Berkeley, um, uh, one of the, the, the more significant things that I think really kind of helped shape my career and path was um, when, uh, as a young law student, um, I had the opportunity to sit in a, a couple of uh, a sessions um, you know, with uh, uh, the folks who eventually went on to found uh, the Asian Law Caucus. Uh, and that was uh, uh, Dale Minami, Don Tamaki, um, uh, Karen, who, uh, Karen Kai, who I saw on the um, participant list. Um, you know, these were the people who really, I think, for me, demonstrated that maybe Asian Americans can have a different pathway uh, in terms of uh, what they do with their career. Um, and uh, it, it, it really kind of got me thinking in a different direction. Uh, and um, uh, inspired me to, to really look into sort of the Asian Law Caucus and, and figure out whether it can be a home for me in terms of um, launching my legal career. Um, ultimately, it was. Um, uh, and uh, uh, that's whenever I started uh, uh, really beginning to kind of uh, immerse myself into some of the, the activism uh, that uh, uh, has now sort of guided my career since then. Um, I'll also just say too, um, Steve mentioned uh, Daryl Higashi. Um, Daryl was actually one of our first uh, housing development directors at Chinatown CDC. Um, there's a, a funny story about how uh, Gordon Chin, uh, our founding executive director, brought him over from Hawaii. Um, I think it involved uh, cocktails and a lot of confusion uh, and then uh, somehow ending up in San Francisco. Uh, I guess that's how they did it back in the day. Um, uh, uh, maybe we should be doing that way again too. Um, so um, let me just first start off by uh, uh, sharing my screen a little bit real quick here. Actually, this, this part isn't that interesting, but here. One second here. All right. Um, I'm just gonna start just by, by talking a little bit about Chinatown and kind of um, what we, what, you know, what, what Chinatown is to, you know, to us. Um, Chinatown was, was, was really one of the first communities in San Francisco, 1850. Um, it was really a, a function of, of segregation and racism. Um, you know, as, as a lot of folks know, I think there's a similar history with um, J-Town. Um, you know, but back in those times, um, there wasn't integration. So each of our communities kind of had to find their own places. And, and as a result, um, you know, Chinatown, I think, was one of the first immigrant gateways um, uh, in this country. And I use the term immigrant gateway because that's an important kind of through line throughout the history of Chinatown from 1850 until uh, 2021. Um, Chinatown was founded as a place for immigrants to land, um, kind of uh, get their feet under them, find a job, find a community, connect with cultural associations, connect with uh, different opportunities, and, and it essentially became a literal and figurative launching pad um, you know, for those uh, folks who were who were primarily male, quote unquote, sojourner workers, um, uh, to find a, a place in 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 Gold Mountain, which is what you know as Chinese we we called uh, America. Um, uh, the the role of Chinatown as an immigrant gateway um, actually um, has not changed um, in the past uh, you know two hundred ish years. Um, or 100 and I guess what 71 years um, since the start of that community. Um, in 2021, uh, people may think of Chinatown kind of as a visitor tourist trap with curious uh, architecture and everything like that. But at the end of the day, the core function of San Francisco Chinatown and, and, and other Chinatowns across the country, like in New York uh, in particular, um, it still functions as a living, thriving, breathing immigrant gateway. Uh, and when I say immigrant gateway, you know, again, what I mean is uh, it's a place for uh, new immigrant households, particularly low income immigrant households to come, uh, come to a place where um, they can find housing that's still relatively affordable because we are in San Francisco after all, um, uh, find starter jobs uh, in which uh, uh, lack of language skills um, don't necessarily pose a barrier, uh, find uh, cultural uh, connections, you know, through the different associations and the so social networks and, and social sustenance that that provides. Uh, but also uh, it's a place um, uh, where there's a rich uh, network of social service agencies to also provide um, the other kind of supports that folks need uh, to, uh, to essentially uh, uh, come uh, and, and, and make their way out of uh, places like Chinatown into sort of the broader uh, American economy and socioeconomic fabric. Um, 
Chinatown still functions that way today uh, in 2021. Um, the population, the residential population in Chinatown is still very significant. Uh, there's roughly 18,000 um, residents in Chinatown um, over uh, about a quarter square mile. Um, this makes Chinatown the densest residential neighborhood in the country, uh, west of Chinatown, Manhattan. Um, there's also an incredible density of small businesses, um, you know, like a number of other uh, uh, ethnic corridors. Uh, in Chinatown, uh, there's roughly 930 storefronts. Uh, and that's just on the ground floor. We don't have a count of the retail stores on the second floor because it's not so easy to count. Um, but that also then makes Chinatown an incredibly rich depository of um, small businesses and the jobs that those small businesses create. Uh, in addition to that, um, uh, there is, are, are dozens um, upon dozens of family associations that are still located in Chinatown, uh, different kinds of cultural associations, grassroots organizations, all of the and nonprofit associations, and of course, um, the, the healthcare network um, that centers around institutions like Chinese Hospital uh, and Northeast Medical Services. So, to this day, Chinatown still uh, really plays an, an incredibly important uh, support function for you know, Im new immigrant households uh, and um, uh, seniors that are aging in place. Uh, Chinatown is about 40% senior, um, and uh, it, it is a living, breathing. Um, uh, community because because of that. Um, for CCDC, uh, our, our, our reason for being in many ways um, is to really try to protect, preserve, and enhance uh, that immigrant gateway function uh, from kind of a community development um, uh, perspective. Um, and, and even though at this point um, we're a citywide organization, we have housing um, across the city uh, at the end of the day, um, when we think about places and our investment pla in places, um, you know, Chinatown is still at the center of, of what we do. Um, and uh, I, I don't ever see that changing, um, you know, for this organization. Um, we also believe that uh, through kind of the 44 year history of our organization, we, we hope um, that the mere existence of our organization as a community development anchor um, has made a difference in stabilizing this community. Um, and, you know, in some ways, uh, this ties into sort of our theory of change, you know, which is this, this idea that community development uh, organizations who are sophisticated in, um, you know, property and organizing and a kind of a comprehensive community development approach can be stabilizing anchors. Um, uh, we hope we've been able to make that impact in Chinatown. Uh, we've seen the Tenderloin Neighborhood Development Corporation make a similar impact in the Tenderloin along with Tenderloin Housing Clinic. Um, and, you know, um, we believe in, in this as, as a movement, um, you know, that every uh, people of color place uh, should have their own institutions that can shape those places and tailor them to the needs of, of those places. Um, so that's kind of a big a picture framework. Um, Chinatown CDC was, was founded um, uh, uh, around and out of this, this purpose of kind of protecting the immigrant gateway nature. Everything I'm about to say in the next like 15 or 20 minutes can be read in Gordon Chin's book. Um, that's why we keep flashing this image up here. Um, I, I'm sure I can't present it nearly as well as um, what you'll see in this book, but this book really, I think, talks about um, the, 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 the emergence of a housing and kind of land use um, uh, movement in Chinatown, which culminated, I think, in a number of different um, uh, tools and, and kind of outcomes, including a Chinatown master plan um, and an affordable housing kind of a strategy to kind of hold Chinatown. Um, let me just sort of, oh, here we go. I didn't even have to touch that. Uh, the mission of our organization is pretty simple. It's to build community to enhance the quality of life. Um, that doesn't really mean a lot because it's a pretty expansive um, uh, mission. Um, you know, so I'll, I'll just kind of distill it down to, to sort of a, a couple of very straightforward functions. Um, at the end of the day, building community to us means building uh, in two ways. Um, one is sort of a bricks and mortar building, literally building the bricks and mortars of a, of a community by either acquiring and, and rehabbing or developing uh, housing uh, and, and, and typically speaking, the attendant commercial space that comes with it. Um, at this point in the, in the evolution of our organization, uh, we have about 36 buildings throughout um, San Francisco, about 3,500 um, units. Uh, a, a roughly uh, a third of which are, are in Chinatown. Um, and uh, we've been able um, to, to, to have a bunch of opportunities and partnerships 
uh, through which we've been able to grow that function. Um, but just as important um, as the, the bricks and mortar building kind of component of our organization is the people building uh, component of our um, organization. You know, towards that end, um, we've never sort of disinvested uh, from the people building component. We have four sort of people building component teams. Um, the first one is our community organizing team uh, in which we work primarily with um, low income monolingual tenants. Um, we support uh, three um, organizations in particular which are self-run, self-led. Um, one is Community Tenants Association. Uh, they're actually the largest um, paid membership tenant organization in San Francisco. A lot of people don't know that. Um, they have a 2000 plus membership list uh, and they have uh, their own 501c4 status um, with a governing board that at least pre-pandemic would, would meet on a weekly basis. And so they're incredibly active and, and they're, they're truly grassroots leaders for, for our community. Um, we've also supported uh, for years, oh, and by the way, some of the pictures you're seeing here, especially one, the one up there, is a monthly um, gathering of Community Tenants Association that is uh, named Super Sunday, uh, very creative, um, uh, named by Reverend Norman Fong. For those of you who know Norman, that's a very Norman name, um, but we're able to do that every uh, uh, last Sunday of every month, and, and typically four to 600 CTA members will attend, um, and it's a social gathering, but it's also a gathering uh, to talk about issues um, and, and to advocate. Um, uh, on on a, a second team that we have is our community planning team. Uh, our community planning team, you know, really focuses on a couple of functions, including um, uh, making sure that we're safeguarding the Chinatown master plan and the zoning uses sort of intended within that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but they also play a, a really critical role in shepherding um, uh, a community, you know, public resources and infrastructure into Chinatown. Uh, so like J-Town Task Force, they do a lot of work around open space. Uh, they do a lot of work around transportation, advocacy and planning, uh, pedestrian safety. Um, and more recently, they've, we've begun to do more work and more investment uh, in and around um, uh, placemaking. Uh, and, and I think what we try to rename it to is placekeeping uh, to make sure that we can uphold the cultural integrity of places like Chinatown and use that as a way of uplifting the identity uh, of the community as, a, as an immigrant um, gateway. Um, we also have a youth leadership development team, you know, which is the pipeline for the future. That team is coming into the 30th anniversary um, and uh, we're really proud of it, you know, and are proud of the, the folks who graduated that team um, uh, from that program. We've seen them really enter into a number of different leadership positions, both within Chinatown, within CCDC, but within the broader scope of the city. Um, and, and having sort of young people kind of come up in an environment uh, like that um, uh, has been um, uh, just really, I think, a, a sustaining kind of leadership uh, project, um, development project that uh, we're, 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 we're proud to have been able to hold. Um, Chinatown CDC uh, was founded um, out of a moment uh, in which the, the, the immigrant gateway and in fact the very nature of the community um, came under threat. Um, I think this is sort of a common heritage that a lot of our communities um, had. Um, some of you uh, may kind of have been there, so if, if so, I'm speaking to the choir and sorry for that. Uh, but you know, there were a couple of seminal events um, you know, that really were influential in catalyzing the creation of Chinatown Community Development Center. Um, I think the, the, the most prominent of those and the well-known of those um, uh, is, of course, the international hotel struggle. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, International Hotel was the last standing uh, single room occupancy hotel, uh, not actually in Chinatown, but in Little Manila or Manila Town. Um, uh, Manila Town actually used to span from Market Street uh, up, Kern, up the Kearney Corridor all the way to Chinatown. And during the 60s and 70s, during downtown expansion, um, corporations were buying these SRO hotels, demolishing them and converting them into high rise office building to, to eventually kind of create uh, the financial district. Uh, when the development got all the way up to I Hotel, um, you know, that's when a number of communities came together uh, to really sort of take a, 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 a stand to kind of protect this hotel. The struggle started in uh, 1970. Um, when a lot of organizing uh, happened out of this building uh, from actually artists um, who were housed in the basement of the building. Um, these are the Manila Town uh, Filipino American activists who, who we owe a huge um, you know, debt of gratitude. 
Um, Asian Law Caucus uh, stepped in to provide legal representation and eviction defense, I think, uh, on the appeal uh, of this building. Um, uh, and, and despite a seven year organizing struggle, which was really, I think, seminal for, for all of San Francisco, um, ultimately, uh, the, the effort um, failed in protecting uh, the building itself um, because uh, apparently uh, the sheriff um, came in at 2 a.m. with horses, broke through kind of the human barricade that the community had formed to sort of protect the building, uh, and then were able to use that as a basis for literally dragging out uh, the senior um, uh, Manong occupants of, of the S of, of I Hotel in chains. Um, uh, and that eventually led to the demolition uh, of the building. But that was a clear signal to the community that land use and housing needed to be protected, and we need to think a little more critically uh, about that. Um, and a number of our founding um, members um, were at I Hotel, including Gordon Chin, including Reverend Norman Fong, uh, and a number of the founding board members of Chinatown CDC. So that's a really important legacy to us. Um, another kind of critical founding event in the history of kind of Chinatown CDC in Chinatown um, was the, the, the leadership of the Ping Yun Resident Improvement Association, and in particular, Mrs. Cheng Jok Lee. Um, and her husband, George Lee, in organizing a, a, a public housing rent strike. Um, and, and Ping Yun is, a, is the public housing projects in Chinatown. It was the first uh, a, a rent strike in San Francisco history in public housing. It happened in Chinatown and it happened in response to um, public safety issues, um, and I, which I'll just quickly summarize. Um, it was a, 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 an incredibly difficult situation in which a young woman at the Pings was raped, repeatedly pushed over, um, one of the barricades uh, ultimately falling to her death, um, you know, which led to a lot of organizing uh, by Mrs. Lee uh, around uh, trying to, to make sure that uh, the pings would become more safe. Uh, Mrs. Lee is still here with us today. Um, she still um, kicks our butt every time we go see her. Um, and, uh, you know, she's the only person that I know of who can credibly yell at anybody in the city, um, you know, from uh, 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 community activists to, to mayors and politicians. Uh, and everybody shuts up because it's Mrs. Lee. Uh, she's an amazing person. If you come to Chinatown, um, she loves uh, uh, meeting new folks. Um, and, and, and so a lot of these kind of events were really what led, I think, to the a number of uh, individuals and entities and organizations um, in Chinatown, um, uh, leading to sort of the need to create a community development entity uh, to begin sort of paying attention to some of these things. So for Chinatown CDC, we're actually the, the, the creation of five kind of uh, uh, topical sort of grassroots led organizations. Uh, this is sort of a little chart, I won't go through them, but you know, the five entities were paying attention to housing, public housing, open space transportation, um, and public facilities. And that ultimately led to the formation of the Chinatown Resource Center in 1977. Um, and then a year after that, we formed the Chinatown Community Housing Corporation, CCHC, uh, and we merged into Chinatown Community Development Center uh, in 1998. Uh, the merger was less uh, monumental than you'd think, um, because while we were two separate corporate entities, um, both organizations were actually uh, led by Gordon Chin. He was executive director of both at the same time, um, and, uh, and we actually shared a lot of functions. And so... Um, the merger just made sense, I think, over time. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Oh, and that, we always joke that arrow uh, is pointing to uh, Gordon Chin. You can't see him, but he was out there and he really was an activist. So anyway, that's a horrible joke, really just for staff. Um, I, I mentioned, um, you know, before that we, we do, um, uh, we build community in two ways, um, housing and then kind of on the people side. Um, you know, one of the things that um, uh, we, we do with our staff, and I'm going to go through this really quickly, but I mean, this sort of next series of slides really kind of shows the evolution of our, of our housing work. Um, you know, I'll stop on a couple key, key things. Um, we began our housing work uh, really through kind of a, a need and a process to try to preserve and protect uh, Chinatown housing stock. And so we actually started in the 80s by acquiring buildings, rehabbing them, and then converting them into permanent affordable housing. Um, over time. Um, uh, this, this building that says the Beat Museum in particular, we, we like to show that off. It's the Swiss American Apartments. Uh, that's actually a, a SRO hotel where uh, Lenny Bruce, the famous comedian, used to live for a little bit. Um, and it was um, a, a, a center place for a beat, beatnik activism 
uh, in the 60s and 70s. Sorry, the slide's not working. Um, in, the, in the early 90s, we were invited into the Tenderloin, and so we have a number of buildings there. Uh, we also began uh, uh, low-income housing tax credit um, development projects, which um, uh, you know, really got going in the 90s, and we we're one of the first organizations that really began jumping into it. Um, I think in 1993, um, as legend uh, has it, um, we developed a 200-unit building, which actually constituted one-third of all the housing produced in San Francisco in that year, um, <coughs> which means there were only 600 units developed that year. Um, so it wasn't kind of uh, that ambitious. Um, uh, we began sort of a bunch of new construction uh, work in, in the 90s, in the 2000s, and this is actually where we intersect with Japantown again, <coughs> uh, excuse me, um, uh, we got involved in a number of, of projects to, I don't know why this keeps advancing by itself, sorry about that, um, we got involved in a number of projects uh, where affordable housing um, uh, restraints were put on them, those restraints were expiring, uh, and we were part of a process of jumping in. Uh, and acquiring those buildings um, and then uh, making them permanently affordable. There's two of those buildings actually located in Japantown, Golden Gate Apartments and Namiki Apartments on Post and Sutter. Um, in 2005, um, we, we really had the honor of um, actually rebuilding the International Hotel for uh, CCDC. In many ways, that was kind of a, a, you know, coming full circle um, because many of our folks had their start in activism and community work in iHotel. Um, over the years, there was an effort to not allow development on that space. It was an empty parking lot for 25 years. Uh, and we finally were able to um, work on that project uh, and move it uh, towards rebuilding and reopening in 2005. Um, so again, I invite anybody to come and take a look at that building um, uh, back uh, uh, in the pandemic when you can. Sorry, I'm just doing a quick uh, time check. Um, how much time do I have left, um, Nina? Sorry, another five minutes? Yeah, five minutes. Okay, great. Um, and I'll kind of just run through this really quickly. Um, since then, we've done a number of different uh, projects. Um, one series of projects we did were actually um, a, a result of Lonum Prieta, uh, particularly when some of the freeways came down after that. And we advocated and did a lot of land use and planning work to try to get some of those freeway sites dedicated towards affordable housing. Uh, and we were lucky enough to do a, about four developments, um, uh, both in the Western Edition and Chinatown uh, around that. Let's see here. Uh, and then, uh, you know, fast forwarding to the current period, um, in the last five years, um, organizationally, um, we, we, we have been in a position to do uh, a number of different projects, um, uh, doing roughly $800 million in development uh, in the past five years, uh, a big function of a big portion of which actually um, had to do with kind of the redevelopment or the actually, excuse me, the renovation, remodeling and uh, transition of the Chinatown public housing projects um, uh, under the rental assistance demonstration program. And so we're now uh, uh, come full circle on that as well. I, I don't know why this is moving forward. Sorry. Um, I'm going to actually stop sharing because I can't figure out how to control my own slideshow. Um, uh, but, you know, again, it's another full circle thing. Um, the, the Pinion Resident Improvement Association, the Public Housing Association, actually was one of our, our founders. Um, and, you know, 42 years later, um, Chinatown CDC was uh, able to actually um, uh, take over ownership of the public housing projects in Chinatown uh, and, and really upgrade um, those and, and, and hopefully transform them um, uh, for the better. Um, in, in terms of kind of uh, the current sort of uh, issues, and, and so one thing I just wanted to mention just from an organizational development um, you know, standpoint for Chinatown CDC, um, you know, our, our model kind of, of, of development, organizational development over time has really been a, a model of, I think, slow and steady growth, um, you know, kind of culminating and I think somewhat explosive growth over the last five years. Um, but the, the process of developing kind of the expertise uh, capacity um, and sort of organizational um, uh, balance sheet, frankly, to be able to support uh, property development, uh, asset management, and, you know, operational management um, really took decades and decades to grow. And that's not necessarily the only model, but that's the model that um, Chinatown CDC embarked on um, in the last two or three years, or actually five years, excuse me. We've seen a couple of um, BIPOC-led organizations um, grow into sort of robust CDCs in a really, really quick pace and in a manner that I think we haven't seen before. And I think that's really, really uh, helpful. 
Um, one organization to track is Mission Economic Development Agency um, in, the, in the mission. They went from basically um, one building uh, in a commercial building uh, to over a thousand residential units in five years. Um, that's unheard of in the history of San Francisco. And we're glad that um, that happened um, uh, with our you know, Latino uh, brethren and sisters. Um, similarly, uh, we've seen young community developers, a black led organization that's focused in the Bayview um, go from sort of zero uh, property uh, to uh, approximately 400 um, uh, housing units in about five years as well. And that's, um, or excuse me, 54 housing units, but 300 uh, ish in, in their pipeline. That's really amazing too. And I think it kind of uh, signals some hope for the potential to develop uh, uh, BIPOC led place based CDCs in the future. Um, in terms of Chinatown looking forward, um, you know, I think all of us are a little uncertain what the post pandemic era is going to bring. Um, I'll just say from my, my, my standpoint, you know, I'm deeply concerned and we're deeply concerned about um, a repeat of kind of the quote unquote recovery that happened uh, out of the last recession. It was a recovery that was uneven, that favored the wealthy, and I think that created greater levels of wealth divide and wealth division. And in San Francisco, you know, that was expressed in the fact that real estate uh, prices um, went up and up and up and really led to a situation where it, it displaced and gentrified a number of communities. And our concern, uh, we're deeply concerned about that happening in San Francisco again, uh, and possibly happening in Chinatown. Um, you know, towards that end, we're really looking at a, 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 a strategy in Chinatown of trying to acquire and you know, land bank and, and, and basically preserve the affordability of as many uh, single room occupancy buildings as possible. Uh, we have a goal of acquiring a thousand units uh, in, in over a 10 year period beginning in 2020. Um, uh, it's challenging to figure out how to finance that um, coming out of the pandemic, but we're uh, pretty positive that the capital is gonna be there, um, but there's a lot of operating issues that are a concern. The second kind of issue, of course, that we're deeply concerned about is what's going to happen to the future of our commercial spaces, uh, particularly the ones that have a cultural function and that serve the community. Um, you know, there's always a potential for those of being gentrified. And, and I know you guys are sort of facing that problem in Japantown as well. Um, one of the pilot projects that we hope uh, that Chinatown CDC will have an opportunity to work on um, is the redevelopment of a large uh, banquet dim sum space in Chinatown called New Asia and ultimately conversion into senior housing, but also um, uh, bringing back the banquet space, um, you know, as a community hub uh, and a community, um, you know, place for food gatherings um, and kind of uh, restoring and, and, and preserving um, that community function of the existing banquet space and, and hoping that that can potentially be a, a model for infill development that can both enhance and, and preserve the, the community at the same time. Uh, so, you know, hopefully in five years, I'll, I'll be able to tell you that we we're successful uh, in doing that. Um, we'll see. Um, and the third thing that, you know, I also want to just uh, uh, put out there is what I think is, a, is an important future for the city of San Francisco. And, and I think a lot of urban jurisdictions, again, is sort of, I think, the development and support for uh, BIPOC-led um, place-based CDCs um, where people of color are. And so towards that end, and again, I'll just admit we're copying Little Tokyo because they did this a, a decade ago. Um, uh, they've been so successful at it that talk doesn't even talk about it anymore. Um, you know, but uh, uh, for us, I think what we're really looking at is a strategic kind of decision uh, to try to partner, um, you know, with BIPOC-led CDCs um, that are trying to uh, grow their capacity uh, to do uh, development projects on their own so that they can serve their communities independently. Um, we've been lucky enough to partner with uh, Meta. Uh, in, in two projects and hopefully a third. Um, and we're trying to figure out a way to partner with young community developers on a, on, on a first project. And so um, uh, we're, we're hoping um, you know, that we can also um, support movement growth uh, of BIPOC-led CDC, CDCs you know, by leveraging our capacity um, you know, in, in 20, 2021 to, to help other uh, uh, people of color folks um, like, uh, develop their own capacity. So. I'll stop there and uh, sorry, I went over a little bit. Thank you very much, Malcolm. If we were live um, with uh, the hundred of folks that are attending this panel, um, we would have loud applause and appreciation 
uh, for the information that both you and TAC presented, but it also, again, reinforces to us on staff why we ask Chinatown neighborhood, and particularly we're privileged and honored to have you, Malcolm, uh, come and uh, present. Uh, what's happening, um, members of uh, our community, is that we're getting ready for now the Q&A. Uh, there's going to be a few rules that we're going to have to try to have um, cooperation from because there's 100 folks in here. And we're going to try to do Q&A by having you folks use your electronic uh, hand raising. Uh, we have over 100 folks, people in, uh, in attendance. Uh, we greatly ask for your patience. We ask to uh, please be respectful to all those who wish to ask a question. Uh, feel free to put public comments in the chat. That's active. Uh, point of information, we have staff, uh, Nina Bazan Sakamoto and Susie Kagami uh, monitoring the chat. Um, leave the floor open to questions only. We timed this out to have at least 45 minutes of questions if we can. Um, now to ask questions, go to react, react, reaction at the bottom of your screen. Use the raise your hand button to queue. Zoom will put you in order of first priority. That's how we're gonna be able to at least have equity with the attendees who wanna to speak tonight. Our JTAF staff, Brandon Kwan, our administrative assistant, will call upon you in groups of four. Please mute your mics until we are able to call on you. Uh, questions on the Facebook chat will be monitored, but prefer preference would be given to those in the Zoom session. At 7.45, uh, we're gonna go into our last speaker or two, and then uh, we'll have board chair Sandy Mori give remarks, and then we'll have both speakers give their final remarks to Malcolm. At this particular point, uh, Brandon, can you please call uh, the first uh, four speakers? And again, when you come speak, please uh, specify who you're asking the question to. And uh, please, again, take in regard a question and the time to the speakers of answering. Go ahead, Brandon, please. Uh, we don't have any yet, Steve, but we have some in the chat. Okay, well, give a second for folks that are live within the room to be able to do that. How many folks you got on chat? Looks like we had about three questions in the chat. Okay, let's start with that. And please, attendees, uh, start using your electronic hand. And if your electronic hand doesn't go up or if you don't know how to do that, please use chat. But let's start with the questions in chat. If there's a name there, Brandon, as well, so you can call that speaker up, please, at this time. Um, Joyce Nakamura asked a question for Little Tokyo Service Center. Can uh, you have that? Can you have that speaker come on and ask our questions now that you recognize who that person is? Sure, Joyce Nakamura. Hi. Yes. Um, so I had a question about the uh, the the legacy fund that TAC talked about. The um, what was it called? I forgot. The, the community the, impact fund. Yeah. So when did it, it it's did it start just recently? And what are what are the goals? Uh. So um. Let's see. Uh. What year are we in? So we are in 2021. We started. It was the discussion started back in um, 20, 2017, I believe. And then it was formally established, I believe, in 20, 2019. Um, and then the formal goal is really to acquire uh, commercial properties in, in and out of Little Tokyo, uh, primarily, um, you know, targeting. Um, um, the main, the two main commercial corridors in Little Tokyo to buy it, and then um, uh, essentially house the commercial space uh, with below market rents, so that small businesses and legacy businesses in Little Tokyo could stay in Little Tokyo. Next speaker, please. 
Brandon, thank you, Joyce. Um, all three questions came from Joyce, actually. Okay, can we have the general audience, please? Uh, this is their opportunity to ask a question. I have Jeff Matsuoko, then Dale Higashi, Steve. So Jeff, go ahead, please. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi, this question is really for TAC. Um, you mentioned that um, that your, your organization is involved in this, um, I guess is a pilot project for the Community Land Trust for LA County. And, and I'm wondering, the thing is that, what, 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 I think you mentioned it, but I'm just curious, what was what, what the governance model for that? I mean, who, who, who are on the board and, and, and how does that work as far as, um, you're, you're saying you're also gonna actually uh, gift that land back to this trust. Is, is that correct? That's the development that you, you developed there, basically. Oh. Uh, that's correct. So we have a, a MOU with this land trust in East LA right now. Uh, we just developed it, that MOU. And there is, and the land, land trust, uh, you know, is, a, is, a, is, a, is actually a separate entity uh, made up of community, community, essentially it's community members, um, you know, who's looking at equity and housing, you know, real estate equi equity from a different lens. And, um, you know, for us, just because LTSC, you know, we're a, you know, we're a CDC that, you know, acquires properties and manages properties, um, you know, over the next five years, we want to um, develop, um, uh, help develop uh, this community land trust that we're partnered with uh, to develop their capacity and experience uh, so they could, um, you know, manage this, manage this property. And, there, you know, the idea there is, um, uh, shared equity amongst the residents, uh, the 11 households there. Um, and, um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we feel that this group made up, you know, it's made up of board members who we feel that are, um, you know, essentially do right by the community. Um, and, you know, we have a mission alignment there. So, um, yeah. So you basically went in and made an agreement with that group, say, and basically because you felt that it was important basically uh, for that group to have that land for community sort of preservation, basically. That, that, that was your determination. Correct. Um, and then uh, as part of this pilot projects, there, there are a number of, of CDCs paired up with um, these community land trusts throughout LA. And they're also part of this larger California community land trust network, um, uh, right. which, which we're part of as well. Um, so it, I believe it's, you know, it, it's not a new initiative uh, by no means. This community land trust has been around for decades and decades. Uh, but, you know, because housing costs are so expensive, uh, we felt that this is kind of a way to, um, um, you know, not just build capacity uh, for these organizations, but just another new way of, um, you know, get, you know keeping, keeping rents reasonable. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have Daryl Higashi and then Rich Hashimoto. Daryl, please go ahead. Hi. Yeah, a question for um, my good friend, Malcolm. Hi, Malcolm. Um, one of the things that the Japantown Task Force and community has been dealing with, and I, I believe is a struggle, and I believe might be a struggle with other ethnic-based communities, is that um, there's a real strong push, and you're probably familiar with this, to give community preferences as new affordable housings are being built. I saw in the planning guidelines, um, and maybe you guys already implemented, but um, the term community preference, and I saw something about within a half mile radius of where the development is being built, that that uh, consideration has to be factored in uh, as part of your lottery or rent up. And maybe you can just give us some sense of, um, is that a real guideline that you folks have been um, required. I don't really use the required, but embrace and give us a give us your insights of what your thoughts on that is. Because I, it there's I think there's pluses and minuses to that. But as a developer and it's like you said, as a community advocate and a community organizer, I'm kind of curious to hear uh, what you got what your thoughts are as you guys move forward to new projects in different communities. Um, yeah, well, first of all, Daryl, it's nice to see you, man. It's been a little bit. So, um, you know, I, I, it's good to, good, to see, good to see your face. And, and as I mentioned earlier, Daryl is an integral part of CCDC's history. So 
Um, hopefully I won't get this answer wrong and he won't report me uh, <laughs> back to my board. Um, uh, just, you know, I, I think the, the question of preferences has always been a little bit um, complicated. Um, there's actually numerous, um, you know, preferences um, that have come about in the, in the city and county of San Francisco. Um, there, there's, first of all, there's a, an overlay kind of, you know, broad sweeping preference uh, for residents of San Francisco generally, which I definitely think is appropriate. Um, there's another layer of preference um, uh, for, it's called certificate of preference holders. And these are folks who essentially have been displaced from redevelopment areas um, like Japantown, like, you know, Western Edition, Fillmore, you know, like South of Market, Yerba Buena area. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, I would, and there's another preference also for um, folks who have been uh, evicted or are in, in imminent threat of eviction. This is sort of the Ellis Act preference. Um, and then most recently, and I think, you know, this is what Daryl's uh, referring to, um, is there's a preference um, uh, for uh, basically local residents for projects in their district. Um, that preference is structured kind of in two ways, depending on sort of the financing source of the project. Um, if the project is, has no uh, federal funding other than CDBG, um, the preference is actually based upon uh, your residency in a supervisorial district. So roughly 25% um, of, of the units in that, in whatever project that opens uh, would, would be preferenced for um, residents of the supervisorial district. Um, the other kind of preference system, the half mile radius one, um, Daryl, that you mentioned, that's typically tied to uh, projects that um, have federal funding uh, linked to HUD. Um, and that was actually negotiated um, by, you know, by Mayor Breed um, after the other preference I mentioned was sued for, fe for uh, federal fair housing issues. Um, you know, do I think that they, they work? Um, I think that if as a city and community, we invest enough resources in the outreach necessary to make these successful, um, it, it, it can work. Um, you know, as um, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but as Sandy probably knows in some of the panel presentations we made this week, um, we worked with one partner who uh, actually was able to successfully fill 25% of their units with COP holders, uh, certificate of preference holders that is. Uh, and for one project um, that we did, we were able to fill 50% of the units um, with preference holders from across kind of all of these different categories that I, I just mentioned, not just COP, not just neighborhood, but also uh, the, the eviction uh, uh, preference as well. And this doesn't count the San Francisco preference because that's pretty much um, everybody. Um, I think there's a, a mixed bag in terms of preferences, depending on kind of how you look at it. Um, I will say, and, um, and just, to, you know, in the interest of transparency, CCDC um, opposed a, a, a number of these neighborhood preferences, um, you know, but I think we've since come and, and come around to kind of, um, you know, frankly support these preferences. But, you know, our concern was just that um, most uh, new housing stock wasn't being built in areas where there was a concentration of low income um, um, uh, APIs. Uh, and that the preference system was going to actually be uh, harmful for our community, but um, uh, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll be the first to admit that I think that that fear was unfounded, and we're actually uh, in a place where I think preferences can work if we do adequate um, outreach. Um, I, I actually want to quickly address uh, Jeff's question um, just around the land trust, um, just kind of by way of history. Um, there is actually a San Francisco Community Land Trust. Um, you know, here I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. Um, their first project was actually in Chinatown. Um, it was a project that um, I was uh, a counsel for the tenants who were in uh, threat of displacement. Um, the building was going to be demolished. And, um, you know, long story, seven year saga uh, made short. Um, we represented the, the tenants in an eviction defense fight. Um, we settled the building by um, working with the land trust to acquire it and converting it into limited equity housing. Um, uh, so sort of basically shared equity housing, as Tahak mentioned. And I think the underlying model of the San Francisco Community Land Trust and a number of land trusts we've seen um, is this idea that the land trust owns uh, the underlying kind of uh, ground or air rights uh, and, you know, whatever sort of ownership entity, particularly if it's a, a multi-unit building um, and it's a co-op, they'll actually own the bricks and mortars of, of the building uh, and then kind of distribute the units via um, shares, um, you know, essentially like, you know, kind of stock right in the building and each of those shares are tied to a unit. Um, but in terms of the limited equity piece, um, it's limited because the shares only represent a fraction of the value of the unit and most of the value resides in, in the underlying 
uh, building itself. So anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. Brandon. Thank you, Jeff. We have Rich Hashimoto, and then I have one question from the chat after that. Mr. Hashimoto. Thank you. Um, Malcolm, thank you very much. Uh, talk, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Richard Hashimoto, and it's not so much of a question, but my question, it's more of a comment to Malcolm. Uh, congratulations uh, to Chinatown on the Board of Supervisors legislation this past Tuesday, uh, approving that the Chinatown mixed use district and uh, prohibiting retail workspace within Chinatown. But as far as economically, uh, I feel that that may hurt Chinatown uh, economically, you know, as being a president of the Merchants Association. You know, I, I, I'm just thinking about um, the foot traffic uh, through Chinatown, the added uh, businesses and occupancy of the vacant storefronts. Can you comment on that? Um, yeah, so let me just start off by saying um, thank you for the, the thanks, um, Rich, um, but I will just say that I think the, the media, the, uh, uh, you know, whoever wrote the Biz Times, I think they mischaracterized um, that, that legislation. Um, the amendment to the Chinatown plan there wasn't actually to block um, uh, workspace retail from coming in. Um, it was actually intended um, to essentially put some greater levels of community control uh, around non-conforming uses um, in spaces that exceed the size cap uh, in, in Chinatown, because right now what's happening is like, if you're basically like say a restaurant that occupies more than 5,000 square feet um, under a non-conforming kind of use sort of situation, you can, you can convert that into sort of other non-conforming uses um, without any kind of community process. Um, the, the, the legislation, actually what it does is, is it doesn't block that. It, what it, it does is it puts a conditional use in place that would actually allow for that and allow for entities to exceed the 5,000 square foot space cap in Chinatown generally, so long as you can show um, you know, that whatever is coming into that space actually directly serves Chinatown. Um, so it, it was unfortunate um, that the, the, the press kind of mischaracterized it. It's a complicated issue, you know, clearly. Um, but in our opinion, that actually is going to create more opportunities for um, uh, uh, nonprofits and businesses that serve Chinatown uh, to occupy these spaces. Thank you. I have two more questions, Steve. Uh, Lori Yamauchi and then Karen Kai. And then I have some questions in the chat. Thank you very much, Brandon. Karen Kai, please. So, sorry, Lori was first. Lori and then Karen. Lori Yamauchi, please. Yes. Hi, uh, this is a question for both um, Malcolm and Tak. Um, I understand that Chinatown has a master plan and uh, so does Little Tokyo. So could you comment on how those master plans were developed and how those master plans have guided your um, organization's uh, development? Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I could start. Uh, so in Little Tokyo, we have uh, a community uh, plan called the Sustainable Little Tokyo. Um, it was a it was created back in 2013, and it was um, it it came about through a series, um, maybe a two year process of visioning sessions. Um, um, you know, we had a, a lot of meetings, a lot of engagement, and really um, because um, you know, oftentimes like people who you know come together. Um, uh, you know, be, I, I, well, you know, the one thing I do want to say is like, with regards to the engagement, we really do need to meet people where they're at. Um, and uh, because of that, we had to do so many series of meetings, you know, whether it was, um, you know, with the seniors, with the youth, with the residents, with the workers, with the small businesses, with, with the institutions. So that's why that's part of it. Part of the reason it took, uh, it took a while. Um, and, you know, we were, and Little Tokyo Service Center helped in the in um, uh, getting uh, a planning grant uh, to create this vision. And um, through that planning grant, we were able to bring on uh, consultants, um, mainly design um, and land use um, uh, con uh, consultants, uh, to develop this plan. And um, <clears throat> you know, we've gone through um, 
a couple of different, uh, a couple of, um, of gone through and going through um, revisioning sessions. Uh, so like a 20, we did like a 2020 uh, visioning session and we're now in the process of updating it again, just because, um, you know, we don't want to keep the plan static. Uh, we, we know that the community is evolving and fluid and, you know, um, you know, crazy things like the pandemic happens, right? So, um, you know, you, you know, and right now we're, you know, again, um, we have a consultant, um, you know, mainly through the Little Tokyo Community Council, which, you know, LTSC is part of, uh, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it definitely guides our work. Um, you know, in, in my presentation, I talked about the Go For Broke Apartments project and a lot of that concept of, um, you know, reclaiming land that was Little Tokyo, uh, that vision uh, was created back in 2013, and it's finally uh, coming to fruition. And it was really led by and guided by, um, you know, the community plan in the Sustainable Little Tokyo Plan. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Tak. Karen Kai, please. Hi, Tak and Malcolm. Thank you both very much. The very informative comments. Um, in general, it seems that for both of you, the um, projects you do focus a lot on resident populations that make up um, whatever community is being served. And one of the big differences that Japantown has from that model is the great dispersal of Japanese Americans. So that if a project were being developed in Japantown and there was this residential preference uh, in the immediate area, there's not necessarily that many Japanese Americans that would qualify for that preference. And, um, and so I'm wondering, how do you deal with that issue of bringing in the cultural community that is not eligible for a preference either by virtue of income or um, uh, these other legally established preferences, how do you do that without violating fair housing laws? You want me to go first, Malcolm, or? or... Um, yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> it's... yeah, I, I got a couple of things I can respond to on that one, but um, yeah, go ahead. Um... You know, I think for us, um, um, because of fair housing, you know, we, you know, we, we don't discriminate and, you know, we welcome, um, um, you know, people of different backgrounds, um, you know, to our buildings, right? Um, and at the same time, um, we, do, we do also provide culturally sensitive uh, services. And uh, because of those services oftentimes, and because of the amenities located in that specific neighborhood. So in, in, in this case, you know, I'll talk about Little Tokyo. Um, the, oftentimes, you know, a lot of the people, I don't wanna say majority, but a lot of the people who are attracted to live in Little Tokyo, uh, whether they're Japanese or not, uh, a lot of them are of Asian descent um, because of the amenities in the, in the neighborhood, because of the services uh, that we provide as, LTSC, um, you know, as LTSC, you know, um, you know, outside of providing, you know, culturally specific uh, services um, in Japanese, we also provide services in Korean and also in Chinese as well, right? So, and because of that, I think um, there's a there's a draw to it. Uh, but but again, you know, get you know, securing um, an affordable housing unit anywhere right now in Los Angeles and probably anywhere in California um, is really, really hard. The last um, building, we, we built the senior housing building uh, in Koreatown a couple, year, a couple years back, uh, 67 units of senior housing. And um, uh, for a little over 4,500 people applied for 67 units, right? So that kind of gives you a sense of uh, the need for affordable, quality affordable housing. So, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, it's a pretty, it's a pretty diverse group of folks uh, that end up uh, in, in our affordable housing buildings. Um, 
first of all, off, I'll just say, um, Karen, it's really nice to see you. It's been some years and, and it, it's really good to see, you know, that you're doing well and, and still kicking butt. So um, really, really nice. Um, I, I think for Chinatown CDC, I'll just say, you know, um, you know, I'll sort of answer this question in sort of two parts. Um, the first part, you know, that I'll just say is that, um, you know, clearly we, we have a different dynamic uh, in terms of, um, uh, you know, Ch Chinese immigrants and, and Chinese immigrants being in San Francisco. Um, there is and has been a, a critical mass. There continues to be a strong level of immigration of Chinese immigrants into San Francisco. So in terms of kind of a critical mass of, um, you know, uh, Chinese immigrant households, it's not the same issue. Um, for us, kind of the issue is, is more around how do we actually keep those folks in place and not be in a position where they're displaced from the communities that uh, they're tied to. Um, and for, the, for us, a lot of this, you know, is centered around our tenant organizing work, eviction defense work, um, the work that we did with Asian Law Caucus over the years, uh, and that kind of that model uh, of organizing and legal work, uh, you know, on a, on a block by block, building by building and unit by unit basis. And we've also expanded that strategy into sort of an acquisition strategy where we, we try to acquire buildings where we know that there's critical mass of Chinese immigrants and particularly where there's uh, tenant leaders uh, to try to keep those folks in place. And it's sort of a people in place strategy. Uh, but, you know, where we we have kind of encountered a situation around a desire, you know, from from different communities we partnered with to bring folks in place. Um, you know, I would say there are sort of two two things that we've seen. Um, that are marginally, you know, effective, but I think it depends a lot on kind of the ability to outreach and kind of reach the population. So one, um, the certificate of preference, um, uh, you know, program that I mentioned earlier tied to kind of displaces of, of redevelopment. Um, there was some legislation passed several years ago that actually expanded the eligibility of COPs um, to not just the direct uh, uh, displaces, but to generations actually who would inherit that. Um, it's incredibly difficult, I think, to do engagement and outreach around that because, you know, the, the ability to trace sort of multi-generations are really tough, but um, it, it is a strategy, you know, I know that the African-American community has really, really invested in, and, you know, we, of course, hope to see, see that become uh, successful throughout the years. You know, the other one strategy that we employed at International Hotel, and, and this is where, um, you know, Karen, I'm going to have to pay you a dollar so you can be counsel and we can um, uh, make this conversation privileged. Um, uh, you know, but the strategy that we employed there uh, was to basically, you know, kind of um, work with the Filipino community to identify certain characteristics um, of, of that community that, you know, may actually preference some, you know, like the Filipino community, because that's what I hotel was. And the two that we identified, one was just giving a preference to former displacees. Um, kind of like COP, but this was tied uh, really just to I Hotel and the block around it. Um, but the other one, um, and it was very creative, was um, working with um, the Veterans Equity Center, um, you know, to create a pre preference for equity uh, for veterans, because we knew that there was a significant number of Filipino veterans. So it was trying to kind of get creative around that. Um, you know, I can't take credit for any of that thinking that was actually, um, you know, Gen, Gen Fujioka came up with that. Um, you know, you, you, you obviously know Gen. Um, you know, and, and sort of Gen came up with that. Uh, we, we, we almost got into a little bit of trouble with HUD uh, and fair housing around it, but we figured it was worth it, um, you know, because of how important that was. And um, so I, I, I think, you know, unfortunately, I don't have a great answer to, to your question. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's just sort of creative strategies on a case by case basis, right. along with some of these big structural sort of things. Great. Thank you both. Thank you very much, Brandon. Uh, two more speakers. We're uh, almost 7.45. Thank you. We have one question from Glynis Nakahara. And then in the chat, I had a question from Stephen. So, Glynis? Uh, Glynis, are you there? If Stephen's there, why don't we go with Stephen first and then if Glennis comes back. Stephen, you had a question in the chat. Do you want to go ahead and read that out? Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, so there's a question for Malcolm. Uh, so my question is, the uh, CTDC owns many properties around the city. Uh, does it exclusively manage and provide services for those properties? And I ask that because I imagine 
the staff would have to scale uh, with those properties if that were the case. Um, so the, 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 the basic answer is um, mostly. Um, so we, 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 we uh, uh, property manage and provide resident services for roughly three quarters of our properties. Um, in the one instances that we don't, um, we typically um, uh, uh, bring in a third party property manager and resident services provider uh, to support the work. Um, but yeah, it absolutely means um, having to scale up um, as we kind of bring on buildings into our portfolio. Um, that creates a whole nother level of challenge. Um, scaling up uh, in San Francisco um, in, a, in, in a difficult employment market and an even more difficult and expensive housing market is no easy task when you're a nonprofit. And so, um, you know, these issues of capacity building constantly come into play. Uh, and for us, the last five to six years have really been dizzying in that, uh, you know, in that in that regard. So, um, yeah, so, you know, we're, we're as long as we're adding new buildings to our portfolio, um, you know, for better, for worse, we're, we're in kind of constant growth mode. Thank you. Um, Steve, Kenji put up a question in the chat about obstacles to potential development that provides workforce housing. Kenji, do you want to complete that question? Oh, okay. I thought, we, I thought we were just going to read it from the chat. Um, well, one issue in Japantown, there's a lot of senior housing here. I don't know if there's a lot of inventory for younger folks. And in particular, um, you know, I, my, um, my condo was purchased in the city's BMR. Uh, housing program. So I look at the list, but I don't see any BMR units over the last 10 years coming up in Japantown area. So I, I guess it's not being built. Um, but what obstacles are there for a potential development that provides workforce housing for people who work in nonprofits um, and also for any remaining certificate of preference holders, um, whether they have a certificate or whether they're yeah. descendants? Um, to to you know to make up for redevelopment and and can you set parameters for that kind of housing um, because we really need a younger base of uh, residents here to take care of the community uh, look after its safety and uh, revitalize its economy um, and I think it's um, it's also important to keep people who work at the various nonprofits within the community as well, if they want to. And, you know, I've spoken to a number of people who, who do, but they can't afford anything here. So can there be preferences like that for nonprofits? And I guess this is more for CCDC since it's San Francisco specific. Thank you, Kenji. Malcolm? Um, I, I guess I, I'd, I'd kind of respond by breaking up sort of my answer into sort of two different kind of categories because sort of there's the workforce component and then there's a the preference component. and. While they're related, they're, they're, they're different kind of policy issues. On the workforce side, um, um, it's a tough question, and, and it actually depends largely on how you uh, define workforce. And, you know, is it defined by kind of, uh, uh, you know, work type like teachers, nonprofit workers, healthcare workers, et cetera, or is it defined by um, income levels, you know, meaning like folks who are in kind of the, the, the 80% area median income range or 80 to 120%, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the day, <clears throat> I would just say the challenge with creating workforce housing, particularly when you move into that above 60% AMI category, is that there's actually no sort, there's no sources of capital to leverage. The tax credit program, which is the primary financing vehicle for affordable housing anywhere, you know, anywhere in the country, not just San Francisco, uh, typically preferences units at the 60% area median income level. And what this basically means is that um, if you, if the city, for instance, puts a dollar in to build a unit for a 60% AMI person, they can typically get two more dollars through the tax credit program and tax exempt bonds, right? So there's a lot of leverage there. When you get above a certain level and you exceed the tax credit limits, which basically pushes you into the workforce arena, there's no leverage. So essentially, instead of the city putting in $1, they have to put in $3. And, you know, the city hates that because it means you're producing less units and the units are more expensive for the city to produce as a whole. This has been the nut that's been really difficult to crack around uh, workforce housing. 
is that there's no leverage for it. And so it's super hard for the city to get their heads around it. Um, there have been some, you know, um, uh, efforts to, to sort of uh, find sort of that leverage, um, particularly with teacher housing. And, and a lot of times um, teacher housing actually leverages um, pension funds that unions create uh, specifically to support their unions, but then they're leveraging back to, to, to essentially help their actual workers. So there's one teacher housing project that's uh, happening right now, I think, out in the Excelsior district that's being built by Bridge Housing. Um, and the city is, is trying to figure out other ways of doing it. But again, because, um, you know, instead of putting in $1, you're putting in $3. Um, it's just not a nut that anyone's being, been able to crack. Um, so, you know, so, so I'll just say, like, that's the core problem. I think in terms of the preference, you know, piece, um, it is definitely possible to attach preference to workforce units. But, you know, again, if you can't even build a workforce unit, there's no, you know, the preference is meaningless. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Go ahead. Tom. Real quick, I just want to add, you know, with regards to the preference, um, um, I do suggest like do it, you know, depending on which group or segment of the population that you're targeting, uh, doing some type of market study or some survey with that group, because like, um, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not too, too sure what, you know, who you're trying to target, um, you know, outside of age and outside of income, but, um, you know, oftentimes like, you know, doing like a extensive survey may show that uh, there may not be a demand for, um, you know, that, that group, you know, that particular group of folks to move into a certain neighborhood or whatnot. So like, um, and that, you know, that also, um, you know, creates, um, um, you know, a, a validity uh, in the eyes of certain of certain folks, investors or whatnot. Um, so, you know, just just something that we we've we've attempted to do in 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 the South Bay, uh, but we did start off with like a survey and a market study. Thank you very much, Tech. Uh, we're at seven forty-five, so we're going to roll into the last two speakers, um, and also we want to encourage everybody uh, before we conclude at eight to start putting your comments or additional questions in chat. Staff is monitoring. Brandon, uh, how many speakers left and uh, could you call them? We have one left. Uh, it's Glennis. And uh, if our mic's not working, I can read it, Steve. OK. OK. Um, for, this is from Glennis. My question is clarifying Laurie's question about the master plan for Little Tokyo and Chinatown. Are these codified detailed zoning prescriptions approved by the Board of Supervisors or more like guiding principles? Uh, can CCDC briefly describe the process and how long it took? You, you want me to go talk or you want to? Okay, sure. Um, so first of all, let me just say, I'm, I'm actually embarrassed that I didn't talk about this in my presentation because if, if, if folks ask me and pretty much anyone at CCDC, what's the most single impactful thing that you guys have ever done? It, it, you know, for us, it's easily uh, the, the work leading up to the passage of the 1987 Chinatown Master Plan. And so Daryl, don't, don't tell Gordon, please. Um, uh, but, you know, the, the, the Chinatown Master Plan is both. Um, it's a set of guiding principles that have been uh, codified and exacted, enacted into sort of a zoning kind of prescription. Um, I won't kind of run through the ins and outs of it, except to say that, um, you know, basically Chinatown, we, there's three pillars of, of what we think about in the, the functions of the community. One is sort of this idea of it as an urban village, which is sort of the affordable residential housing component. The other is this idea of a capital city which really kind of connotes sort of the cultural capital of, of the Bay Area Chinese American community, although now it's really San Francisco. Um, and then the third component is this idea of a, of a visitor and tourist destination. So, so the zoning uh, prescriptions are actually built around those three concepts. Um, uh, and, and, and in particular, it was built around this idea of defending against the expansion of downtown. So first of all, there's a demolition um, prohibition in Chinatown. Uh, if you demolish, you have to replace every residential unit on a one by, you know, one for one kind of, you know, basis. So it's very difficult to demolish. Secondly, there's a height restriction in Chinatown. Uh, you can't build above 40 feet. Um, that's changing a little bit with the statewide density bonus. So you can get a little bit more out of it. Um, but, you know, that is, is a double edged sword, right? On the one hand, it protects the existing affordable housing stock. On the other hand, uh, it, it's very difficult to kind of expand that housing stock. And so there's different challenges around that. And then there's a series of, 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 of use restrictions around commercial property. And this kind of 
Uh, we kind of, you know, addressed that a little bit when Rich raised, Rich Hashimoto raised his question, but these restrictions essentially, um, you know, limit um, uh, anything second story and above to housing and ground floor to certain kinds of commercial uses and certain sizes of commercial uses, really to kind of protect the mom and pop nature uh, of, of kind of uh, uh, immigrant uh, run stores in Chinatown. Um, we, we, we fight like hell to protect that zoning. Uh, we tweak it when we see things that aren't working. But at the end of the day, you know, we really believe the master plan is, is what saved Chinatown and we still stick to that, so. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Uh, that concludes our speakers, Brandon. Yes, that's correct, no more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, TAC. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Uh, everybody can take a deep breath because we originally, when we organized this uh, panel, we locked, we talked about uh, 90 minutes and we moved to two hours so that members of our community and both the speakers were open to a, a hearty session of Q and A. And I think that uh, we benefit from that as well. Uh, at this particular time, I'd like to invite our board chair, uh, Sandy Mori, uh, to say a few words. Um, Sandy Mori, please. Your mic, please, Sandy, you're still. Hi everyone. Thank you very much for attending this session. And Takao and Malcolm, thank you so much for the very comprehensive presentation you gave. Uh, these two organizations, Little Tokyo Service Center and CCDC are major longtime anchor community-based organizations in these communities. And they created the stability, endurance and commitment to maintaining Little Tokyo and Chinatown in San Francisco. So thank you again, Malcolm and Takao. And as we in J-Town look towards issues of development, housing, and including the next generation, uh, we have a lot of work to do. Thanks again. Good night. Thank you very much, Sandy. Uh, it's also, um, I wanna be able to take an opportunity to, to ask both the speakers uh, in terms of a final question of talking about their perspective and recommendations for us here in Yohomachi, San Francisco. And then I have a few announcements to make as well. Uh, to that singular question, uh, Tech Malcolm, um, could you please comment and give some uh, feedback on that question, please? Malcolm? Sorry, go, go ahead, Tak. I, 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 uh, sorry, Steve, I, I actually lost track of the question. So maybe Tak can start. Yeah, asking you comments about the future of Japantown and some recommendations from your perspective, ideas, suggestions, comments, uh, tech, please. Um, I say give Malcolm a call, but um, but in any case, no, that's you know that's um, uh, but in all seriousness, you know, like um, you know, we we you know we kind of joke around about it, but like you know, we LTSC, we look. We, we admire and admire the work that CCDC is doing um, as well as other uh, organizations throughout um, California. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, it takes a village. Um, it takes a lot of people and effort and time. Um, and it feels like, um, you know, and from, and from what I could tell, you guys have a framework uh, in place. You guys have a vision. Um, and I think it's really just a matter of like refining that vision and utilizing the, um, the resources and access and, and people you know um, to, you know, to help you along the way, whether, you know, whether the result is creating a new entity to, you know, to develop something, um, you know, whatever that may be. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, it really is, um, uh, it's a collective effort uh, that, that has to happen. And, you know, I think you know, especially, you know, what we learned, you know, especially during the pandemic, and even before the pandemic that, you know, everything is, is the product at the end of the day is better if it's done collaboratively. And, you know, I, I think I truly believe that our organization believes that. And, you know, um, and it, it feels like you have, um, um, you know, clearly you guys have a great, um, you know, you, you have a network of people that you could lean on. And, you know, I, I will definitely keep, um, you know, please feel free to tap into, um, you know, anything that, you know, we could do 
uh, we could help over here in LA. Uh, but you know, I just I'll just kind of like leave it at that. Thank you very much, uh, Malcolm. Um, maybe I, I'd have kind of two things I'd I'd sort of you know put out there. Um, you know, one just kind of going back to for CCDC, kind of our fundamental and underlying theory of change, which is this idea that CDCs really can stabilize. Um, you know, communities, I would definitely urge, um, you know, JTown to explore the creation of a, of a Japantown, you know, CDC um, to develop kind of a, a level of real estate um, and property operations expertise to kind of have the capacity to address some of these issues. Um, I probably shouldn't be saying this, and I know Tak will get a kick out of this, but Tak's predecessor um, at Little Tokyo um, actually lives down in San Jose, Josh Ishimatsu. Um, he knows what the hell he's doing he might be worth reaching out to. I guess he's working for the San Jose planning department and doesn't want to drive up here anymore. But, um, you know, Josh knows what he what he's doing and, and he might be a good resource uh, just to kind of get in touch with. Um, you know, the other thing I would just say too is that, um, you know, I, I think coming out of the Great Recession, um, you know, the thing that we saw there that I thought was really interesting was that the, the, the issue for them, you know, that in that moment was the failure of um, housing, right? And foreclosures and short sales and how as a nation, um, uh, it really kind of shifted housing policy towards, you know, foreclosure prevention and, 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 and mitigation and massive federal resources and funding kind of conglomerated around, around that. And, and it really, I think, changed the landscape in a lot of different communities that saw blighted and foreclosed homes. The interesting thing coming out of this recession or, or you know, COVID um, is we haven't seen property values, you know, drop all that significantly, particularly in suburbs like San Francisco is one of the few places where it has dropped. And even then it, it, it doesn't even mean anything because things are so expensive here. But I think what, what I would just say is that it feels to me like the analogy of the Great Recession in terms of like home foreclosures is small business failure, right? I mean, like that's actually where, you know, we're seeing a lot of the conversation and attention, particularly for communities. And, you know, I just wonder whether or not it's an opening and an opportunity to, to really kind of advocate on a federal level uh, around sort of like at scale resourcing, you know, to address sort of like, you know, small business foreclosures and the loss of like these community, you know, assets, much in the way, um, you know, uh, you know, Congress and, and the president addressed foreclosures, you know, back in, 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 in um, 2000 and, and, you know, 8, 9, 10, 11. Back then, they launched the neighborhood stabilization program specifically for housing. Um, it'd be interesting to see if there would be a conversation around a similar model for commercial properties. And, you know, and let's not forget, right? I mean, right here in San Francisco, you have the most powerful federal delegation probably in, in, in the country. I mean, you have the Speaker of the House right around, you know, like right around the corner. You have the senior most, you know, senator. And then you also have the, you know, the one of the few Latino senators down in L.A., Padilla, you know, who's also, I think, very, very deeply ingrained in social justice and communities of color. And so, you know, I just wonder to what extent, you know, that also might be a, a strategy to engage in is to really think about this on the on the level of like federal intervention and, and you know, and, 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 and advocacy and, and lobbying, um, you know, frankly. So I, I, I'll just kind of leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much, Malcolm Tech. Um, when I started this session in introduction and information, um, I talked about JTF Culture District in this process of due diligence. And part of that is um, the indication and identification that Japantown with a very hard working group put together in 2013, the Japantown Cultural Heritage Economic Sustainability Strategy Report, uh, which took a huge amount of work uh, to a point of when I mentioned our project that we performed and we are still in review the chess report, the cultural history, housing, economic sustainability report. It's all part of due diligence, due diligence. And again, point of information out of that JHS report uh, came the Japanese Community Benefit District. And this evening, the executive director, Grace Hodakiti, is here as one of the models that we've been trying to do is collaboration between Japantown Task Force and JCBD, Japanese Community Benefit District. And we have a staff person, a small business coordinator that hits the grassroots merchants, a uh, name of Max Nihei that is part of that project as well. 
on the art and culture side, we, the culture this year, are trying to implement our co-creative hub, which is about art and culture. We perfectly thought that this session with you, Tank, and Little Tokyo, similarities in terms of our history, but Japanese American similarities as well, uh, in terms of it, but it was so beneficial to get your information in. For myself speaking, uh, so much inspiration in terms of what can still be accomplished. Uh, Malcolm, you're our neighbor in the sense that Namiki Apartments, as well as the Golden Gate Apartments, are our neighborhood uh, residents. Uh, Steve Ishii of Kimochi is on this line, and he remembers the days when we worked together with Sandy at Kimochi and started to do services uh, at senior housing because we knew that that development was a real strong component of that as well. So I just really want to recognize this and thank you both for talking about the subject matter of community development corporations, uh, the concept of community impact fund, uh, community land trusts and housing. And we thought that this is just a great beginning for that. I need to acknowledge uh, my dear friend and colleague, Bill Watanabe, who's on this line all the way from uh, Southern California that was an inspiration to me personally with all of the trips we made back and forth with our colleagues in terms of Sanse activism and hearing the concept tack of Bill talking about community impact fund and what CCDC was doing in San Francisco and there was a model and inspiration. It's just really exciting to hear that. And Malcolm, in terms of recommendations, thank you. Uh, one question I had in mind, I think I referred it a little bit it's not a question to have to be dialogued today with a consideration that um, a partnership and a collaboration could possibly occur as well. Could it not, Malcolm, in the Japanese community going to what Dax suggested to CCDC and do a partnership collaboration? I think that's something. Did you want to comment on that before we conclude? That is that a possibility as well, or Malcolm? Yeah, I mean, you know, it it, it absolutely is. Um, um, you know, I, I think it it you know, again, the, you know, the devils are in the details, you know, but um, it, it's something that we're, we're committing to, um, you know, right now is to, to really try to invest in partnering, um, you know, and, and joint venturing on projects, you know, with um, BIPOC led organizations that are looking to grow development capacity. So um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. I wanted to conclude this evening and thank staff, um, Nina Bazan, Sakamoto Culture District Project, um, manager uh, Susie Kagami, our strategic partnership coordinator, Brandon Kwan, our administrative assistant. We thank you all and we thank all of you members of our community for staying longer, missing your dinner. Uh, we're really happy to see so many of you as well. So to this point, and we will have many, many other sessions. We're planning a, a, a focus group presently uh, that occurred after we did our listening session and our senior planner for the Department of Planning is with us, uh, Shelly Caltaroni as well. So please look forward to our emails and we will also do all of our information on our committee meetings as well. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good, safe evening and please stay safe. Thank you very much. <laughs>